We're continuing in the book of James, um, chapter 2. How you all doing? You all happy? Could you all just stand for a moment? And now, thank you. Now, could you all sit for a moment? I always wanted to see how much authority I had. Very cool. I was able to move many people. <laughs> wow. This is wonderful. But I can't get someone to move to shut their car off. Okay. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Oh, chapter 2. What are we talking about? Rich and poor people. We happen to live in a community which is pretty much well-to-do. Cocoa Beach is a uh, middle to upper class community. We are, we're blessed, I'm not complaining, but we don't really have a lot of interaction with poor people. But James is talking about poor people. And he opens up in verse 1 and says, My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality, with prejudice, with, um, I don't know, picking and choosing. Now, this verse is more applicable to James' life and culture and society than our own in that there was more class culture back then. You had the rich, the poor. The rich didn't like the poor, and the poor didn't like the rich. Now, we have that here. They had f slave and free, Greek and barbarian. They had the class wars. They had the differences. You had the Jews, the Gentiles. And there was a lot of dislike amongst them. And that's a polite way of saying they hated each other. They did. They hated each other. They despised each other. And James has, 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 has this unbelievable opportunity to try to minister to the churches scattered abroad. And he writes this incredible letter to them, encouraging them how to act as Christians. Now, this is an early church. Like I said, the church did not have the New Testament. And many, many of them didn't even understand the Old Testament. A lot of the Gentile community didn't have any clue of what the Old Testament said. And the Jews themselves didn't have an understanding of what the Old Testament meant in relation to Jesus Christ. So they didn't have what our society has today. We have incredible knowledge of God's design, God's purpose, plan, and rules. But they, di they didn't have that, and yet they lived in a culture that was completely littered with diversity and prejudice. And so he writes this letter, encouraging them, or prompting them to stop hating each other and stop being prejudiced, having partiality. Uh, we have that. It's not, I'm not saying we don't have that. I mean, we have a very ignorant people in our own society. I use that word often, ignorant, because it really describes the situation of people in our culture. Ignorant does not mean stupid, by the way. It, has, it does not mean stupid. You can have a very intelligent person that's ignorant. An ignorant person is a person that's unlearned. And when I speak of ignorance, I speak of the ignorance in Christ our Lord and the Holy Scriptures. There are many people that have no clue what the Scriptures mean or say. So they're ignorant. And in their ignorance, they have harnessed or developed this prejudice towards others mostly groomed from their early ages as children. Parents have a big influence on our children. Uh, most children, uh, they don't say it out loud because they never want anybody to hear it, but they want to be like mommy and daddy. They walk like mommy and daddy. They talk like mommy and daddy. They act like mommy and daddy. Sometimes I'll, we have a, a big full mirror up by our front door, 
And it's not so that we can look at each other because uh, it's there to make the living room look a little larger than it is. And so it's a, it's a deception. It, it's the immaculate deception. And so we have this mirror by our front door. And I'm not kidding. There's times when I've walked past that mirror and went, that's my dad. That's scary. I love my dad, but I didn't want to be like my dad. But we develop these things from our parents and these things that we develop from them, we take them into our lives in the ignorance of what God wants and God designed and what God desires of our lives. We have this ignorance about us. Uh, sometimes we're, that is called a bigot. Someone who is prejudiced. And we have that in our country. That happens. It does happen. And we don't want to say that we're, we're prejudiced. We don't ever want to say that. That's a terrible thing to say, that I'm prejudiced. But let me read the scripture again and give it a context to you in a way that you can go, uh, my brethren. I like the way James, several times in the scripture, speaks of my brethren, my beloved brethren. I mean, when you're scolding somebody, it's nice to say, hey, buddy, you know, that's what he does. He's, he's like, hey, my, my real good buddy, you're, an e. you're not doing things right. So, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Now, none of us want to admit that we're partial, right? We're all like, we love everybody. But we are all drawn to certain people. There are certain people that we favor other than others. I'm, I'm guilty of it. I love all of you more than all of them. Mm -hmm. But we do gravitate towards certain personalities and certain people. And so there's a partiality there. Is it as painfully sinful as the partiality James is speaking of? I don't think so, but it's there. We have partiality. There's those we favor more than others. The, the, the Lord of glory, that term is pretty amazing. The Lord of glory. Now, when you look up the verb context, context and, and you look into the, the concordance and you look at what's the Greek word for this and what's the Greek word for that. And I like to know what the Greek word is because there's different meanings for the, the word glory. And, and I love the word glory that means all that God is. All that he is. Every single attribute of God. His glory. But this particular word means supreme authority is the Lord. That word Lord, it means supreme authority. The word glory means integrity. So if it's the supreme authority of integrity, then listen to this word, verse now. My, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus, the supreme authority of integrity with partiality. Hmm. I like the way James worded that. If God is the supreme authority of integrity, then his, his admonitions or his steering us is worth listening to. It's worth digesting or taking in. And then as he lays this out, this God that declares no partiality, and with God there is no partiality, right? For God so loved the world, right? God wishes that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance. He's not a God of partiality. God is willing to save a poor man as much as he's willing to save a rich man. He's willing to save a slave as much as he's willing to save someone that's free. God doesn't care what color, race, class you are. He's, he's loving his creation. He loves his creation. 
And God wants us, his children, to love his creation, all of his creation. Now, Jesus had favorites, didn't he? Who was he always calling to be with him? James, John, and Peter, right? Always calling those guys. Hey, you guys come with me. Peter, John, come with me. Peter, John, come with me. Now, maybe that wasn't his favorite. Maybe because those two guys were always in trouble, and he didn't want to leave them alone with the other guys. We don't know why, but we know that Peter was a troublemaker. So it could be that Jesus said, Peter, John, stay with me. You know, he probably had a little leash on them walking through the city. I know you guys are able to get in trouble here. Now, I don't want to beat up on Peter and John too bad because, you know, they were probably way better than me. But partiality, God doesn't desire it or want it in our lives. Verse 2 says, for if there should come into your assembly, assembly, this is an assembly. For if there should be uh, come into your assembly a man or a woman with gold rings in fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place and say to the poor man, you stand here, or you sit at my footstool, or you sit on the floor. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, he's not writing this because he doesn't know when, whether or not they're doing this. He's writing this knowing they're doing this. Now, this, the, the book of James is one of the first epistles written, one of the first letters written to the churches, uh, if not the first. So the church is at a very early stage. It's very vulnerable. It's very immature. And you've got this society that's very prejudiced that's seeping into the church. They're taking their culture into the church. And so he paints this picture of a rich man coming into the church where back in that day, I mean, this sounds weird, but maybe you could do this today, too. Um, I'm sure there are some jewelers that will allow this for the right price. But back then, you could go to a, a ring, a person, and you can rent expensive rings. If you were going to go to a party, if you were going to go to an outing, if you had enough money to spend but not really a lot of money, you might rent that ring and reserve it every Sunday for church. And then they would do this. And why would they want to rent a ring to go out? Because in that culture, you were able to get better service if you looked wealthy. And this ought not to be at all. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a, a poor man in filthy clothes. Now, what is a, what is it, why is he describing a poor man with filthy clothes? Poor man with filthy clothes. What are filthy clothes? Obviously, he's speaking about someone that's poor and that smells. That smells. Now, we've had poor people that come into our church to smell, and it's difficult. It's difficult. I, I, have, I have not been blessed uh, because I have a very keen sense of smell. It's one of the, my senses that are very alert is my ability to smell, uh, which is not a blessing, by the way. Because when I smell something that's just not quite right, it's like, mm, mm, mm. it's difficult. It's very difficult. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, we hug each other in fellowship. Does anybody hug each other in fellowship? Yeah, two people. All right. So 
it's not you two, by the way. But I'll hug someone in fellowship, and for the rest of the day, even when I go home, I'm smelling the perfume. I'm like, oh, man, I still smell that. Man. That keen smell. But the keen smell that I have is very vulnerable to dirty people. And I don't say that to, to offend anybody. It's that it's difficult. And then God's telling me, I need to address that poor person as if I would address a rich person. With the same love, with the same attention, with the same dignity, with the same integrity as my supreme authority, Jesus Christ, does. Wasn't it Jesus who went to the poor? Yes. He went to the poor. I, I love when Peter and John went up to the temple at the ninth hour of prayer, three o'clock in the afternoon, to the, to the beautiful gate of the temple. And there is a lame man laying at the, at the temple gate since his youth. He's been paralyzed his whole life, laying there in his filth and in his dirt. Now, when you are lame and you're put there in the morning by your family to beg arms... It's not like you're getting up to go to the bathroom, whether it be number one or two. You're not getting up to go to the bathroom. And so by 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you don't smell very good. And maybe you don't have the ability to take a bath. Maybe you are days of filth and soil. But Peter and John, when they're begging He's begging Peter and John for alms. And then Peter looks at the man. And this is what Peter says, look at us. What a beautiful picture that shows the, the, the brokenness and the misery of a poor person. Because he, he's looking at Peter and John, asking them for money. And Peter has to say, look at us. Why? Because it was just rot. It was just something he did every day. Alms, alms, alms. See the people. Alms, 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 alms. And Peter has to just break into his world and say, look at us. Gets the guy's attention. And Peter says, silver and gold I do not have. Can you see the guy's face? Like, really, dude? You're going to mess with me? Seriously? Silver and gold? What do you think I'm asking for? You know, what did the guy think? When Peter says, silver and gold, I do not have, but, I always love the buts in the Bible, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Right? Did the guy rise up and walk? No, he didn't. It says that Peter grabbed him by the hand and he rose up, leaping and hopping and praising the Lord. He reached down and grabbed him by the hand, his filthy, dirty, disgusting hand. He grabbed him, Peter. And he was raised him up, leaping and hopping and praising the Lord. And he followed them where? Into the church or the temple. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Now, he didn't take him home and clean him up and put nice clothes on him. He brought him right into the temple, leaping, hopping, and praising the Lord. Wow. So there's the picture. That's it. That's the picture. Like I said, our community, it's a, you know, we have a very sterile community. We live in a bubble. I'm not proud of that. I'm blessed by that. But when a poor person comes into our, our assembly, what do we do with them? Do we say, sit over there? Or do we embrace them? You know, when, when church is getting started before it begins, uh, I'll take time to walk out there and talk to people. And um, if I see a new face, I'll, I'll shake their hands. Hey, how you doing? Good to have you. Where are you from? Right? I'm touching them. Right? And then when they're not looking, I'm like, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. 
But would I have the same? Would I truly have the same reaction to a poor person that smells and is filthy dirty? Would I? Would I? Now, out of sanitary reasons, I would take hand sanitizer and wash my hands afterwards. But I hope that I would be as gracious to the poor person as I am to the rich. I would hope that would be possible. Because I would truly love to be like James is commanding me to be. And in their churches, they had this problem where they were paying more attention to the rich person and saying, hey, you sit in this really good seat because you're rich, because you rented a ring. But you poor person, you sit on the floor. Now, when he says, you know, sit, sit, over, sit down there and be my footstool, it, he's not saying that they actually do that. He's saying that's what it's like having them sit on the floor. It's like saying, hey, let me put my feet on you. And in that culture, putting your feet on someone was very disrespectful. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? That's pretty strong. You have become judges with evil thoughts. So when you shun someone because they're poor, he's saying you have, you're, you have evil thoughts and you're a judge. Have you ever seen a poor person and thought to yourself truly within your heart, there but by the grace of God go I? There but by the grace. It's true. There but by the grace of God go I. I grew up poor. Very poor. Extremely poor. And it's not fun being poor. Because along with the poorness, there comes this insecurity about yourself. There's no boldness. There's no outward, you know, I got this. It's like you walk under a shadow. It's like you, you know that you don't measure up to the rest of the world. It's a difficult thing to be poor. We were on welfare. And back when I was a teenager, when you were on welfare, you got government food. Anybody remember government food? White labels that were just stamped what it was. Green beans or whatever it was was on the label. It was just a, green, a white label. It was a can. And the, you got powdered milk. You didn't get milk. You got powdered milk. You didn't get food stamps. And you got, you got a, sack, you a sack of rice. You got, you got stuff. And everything was white labeled. And I see some of you shaking heads like, yep, yeah, been there, done that. But when you have people come over, like your friends come over, you don't let them open the cabinets. Why? Because you're poor. You're poor. I, I, I don't tell you this to, uh, to make anyone ever feel sorry for me. Ever. Everything I've gone through in my life has been a building block for what God has called me to do for him. But um, my clothes didn't always fit me. So what I did is I found an old antique sewing machine in the garbage. And I brought it home. And I set it up and I got it working. And what I did is I taught myself how to run this machine. And I would make my clothes fit. But you know, the funny thing is, I thought it looked good. <laughs> I thought it looked good. You figure, here is a 10-year-old kid making his clothes with no instructions whatsoever. And then putting those clothes on and going to school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. True story. But it's not easy being poor, and it's very, it's a hindrance for your ability to, to press on, to run the race, because you're always less than someone else. And that's what our society does to poor people. Not only do, do, are they poor, but we make sure that they know they're poor. 
by the way we treat them. That's a sin, by the way. That's called sin. It's called partiality. It's not what God has called us to do. God has called us to love everyone like God loves everyone. So we don't want to be judges, and we don't want to have evil thoughts. So what do we do? We love. We love because we are, we are the house for the God of love that lives inside of us. So we should be willing to let the God of love love out of us. Willing. You know, the Bible says to let your light shine. What is your light? Jesus is the light of the world, and he's inside of you, and he wants to shine out of you. And so it says, let your light shine. It doesn't say make your light shine. He said, just let it shine. God is already willing to shine. He's already willing to love. He's just saying, let him love. Let love be without hypocrisy. Let love. Don't make love, but let love be without hypocrisy. And what is hypocrisy? Partiality. Partiality. They deserve my love, and they don't deserve my love. Now, I do realize very clearly that there are some people that wear you flat out, and although you love them, you just don't like them. And you do love them, but they wore you out. That happens. And God has scripture to cover that, too. But in general, we don't want to pick and choose who we're going to love. We want to love everybody God loves. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 20. The poor man is hated even by his own neighbor. The poor man is hated even by his own neighbor. I, I know that it's difficult for us in Cocoa Beach to understand this, but if you go to West Cocoa, or you go to the west side of Titusville or some of the interior cities in our community, you're going to see, uh, in our state, you're going to see, like, especially back in Oak Hill, if you get off the road, you'll see, like, you drive down these roads and you'll see this really nice house and a yard and, and all this stuff is put away and nice. And right next door, there's this trailer and trash all over the place. And it's obvious that this person's poor and this person's wealthy. And they're neighbors. Now, if you happen to live next door to a poor person, and it looked like you were living next to a poor person, would you tend to hate your neighbor? Why don't they clean up their house? Why don't they take care of the place? Because when you're poor, you give up. It's something that happens to poor people. You give up. Why bother? You know? Why bother? And you're hanging on to all this junk in your yard thinking that, well, maybe I could salvage this or maybe I could salvage that or maybe, you know, you're not in their brain. You're not in their thoughts. You don't understand what it's like to be poor. And yet you'll live next door and judge them because why don't they just clean up their yard? It's a mess. Why don't you try spending a couple years in their shoes? It's not easy being poor. And James wants to make this very clear because even in our own society, we can be judgmental and have evil thoughts. Proverbs 14, 20 again, the poor man is hated even by his neighbor, but the rich has many friends. Why is that? Why, do the, why is it that the rich has many friends? See, rich people... There's something maybe you can get out of them or something you can benefit from them. I remember years ago, um, I uh, had a cabinet shop. I, I, start, I was building cabinets. I had a cabinet company, and, and I was doing okay, and you know, I was surviving. I was making ends meet, and there was a guy that had a shop next to my shop, and I remember this guy telling me very clearly, he goes, you need to associate with rich people because that'll give you a, mental, a mentality of 
being rich. You need to associate with the rich and, and those look to those people that are successful and you'll be successful. And uh, I thought, hmm, I'd rather go surfing. I would rather go surfing. I've never been one to worship famous people. I just didn't matter to me that they were rich. But the rich tend to have many friends. Proverbs, 4, Proverbs 19 verse 4 says, Wealth makes many friends, but the poor is desperate. Uh, uh, or separated from his friends, rather, sorry. The poor is separated from his friends. You know, when we, if, if we would just treat the poor the same way we treated the rich people, there wouldn't be a problem at all. If we just, it's not that we have to not treat the rich people uh, nice and then treat the poor people Nice. It's not that at all. We don't have to reject the rich people. That's fine. If they're rich, they're blessed. Praise the Lord, they're rich. But all James is saying is you need to treat the poor person with the same respect. And if we did, there wouldn't be a problem between the rich and poor by just being nice to the poor. Proverbs 22, 7, the rich rules over the poor, and the borrower is a servant to the lender. And this is very, very prevalent in James' day. If you were poor and couldn't make ends meet, you could actually go to someone and you could sell your services to them. I will, I'll, I'll be your slave for X amount of years if you would give me a loan to take care of this situation. And so you would be a slave to the lender. Proverbs 28, 6. Better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one uh, perverse in his ways, though he is rich. A poor man who walks in his integrity. Um, you know, I'm glad that I have been Poor. And I'm glad that I have been content and have abounded in plenty. I'm glad that I've had both sides of the spectrum. I'm really glad. Now, I have to make a little clarification here. Is anybody sick of hearing the poor about poor people yet? You're very partial. Um, now, there are poor people that choose to be poor. A poor person is someone that, under their circumstances, can't help but be poor. But we do live in a society that is what the Bible calls sluggards, lazy, Right? We, we have that. We have, in our society, we have people that would rather just do nothing and beg for food because they're too lazy to work. We have that. The Bible, they had it back then. It says that the, the lazy man is too lazy to pick up a sandwich and put it in his mouth even, the Bible says. And the Bible says if a man doesn't work, he should not eat. That's what it says. So my definition as a poor person, of a poor person, is one who under the circumstances can't help but be poor. Not one who chooses to be poor. If you choose to be poor, then all you're doing is you're, you're, you're a burden on society. And you're expecting to live off of someone who is working, which I think is sinful. Extremely sinful. I'm going to live off of you because you work. 
Um, there, we have a, a homeless person uh, in our in our county, and um, I'll just leave it at that. But he has a crutch and a and a cast on his leg, and he walks around like this, all over town. He just walks all over town like this. So I'm driving down the street one day, and he's been walking with this thing on his leg that is. What he's wearing is supposed to be temporary until you, you mend. Uh, the type of thing he's wearing is something you would wear temporarily until you're mended. So I'm driving down the street one day, and it's raining. Okay? It's raining out. And so, to my surprise, and to God's ability to enlighten me, I drive by this guy. His crutch is under his arm, and he's carrying his stuff, and he's going like this in the rain, just trying to get to cover, walking perfectly. And I was like, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. In my heart, I knew it. So what is that? It's not a poor person. That's called a deceiver. That's what that's called, a deceiver. And who is he deceiving? People with tender hearts. Isn't that something? What do you think that is? Deceiving people with tender hearts, that is the epitome of awful to me. I'll let that go, though. Lord, we pray for all people, all people. So we have to be wise and discerning, we have to have insight, and we need to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if I help someone that's poor, and later on the Lord reveals to me who that person really is, my helping them did not go in vain, because my heart was right, and it was something I was doing out of love. So it's not like I wasted money. It's not like I wasted anything. It, it, I did it in love, so it was credited to my crown in heaven. Praise the Lord. We continue in chapter 2. Listen, my beloved brethren. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Listen, my beloved brethren. There he goes again. My beloved brethren, as I scold you, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? Um, now, the rich choose to depend on God. They make a choice that they're going to make their, have their dependency on God and put all their trust in God, and God gets all the glory. They choose to do that. The poor man doesn't have a choice. He has to put his trust in God. His faith is more sure because it's, it's an utter dependency upon a Savior, the only one that can provide. So there, there's, there's this, this difference between the rich and the poor. Listen, my, brother, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who love him? Heirs of the kingdom which God promised to those who loved him. So the rich love him and have the promise. Those who do trust him and have, they have the promise. But the poor are rich in faith and have the promise because it's that utter dependency. I think the, the most enlightening time of my life was not when I was poor, but the first time I went to Nicaragua on a mission trip, and I got to see what real poverty is. I, I was poor. Hey, the poorest person in, in America is like the top 5% of the world in wealth. 
when, when I went to Nicaragua, and this was back before, this was right after the war, and this is when Nicaragua had not recovered fully, and the economy wasn't being, getting to be picked up like it did over the years. But I went there, and the poverty was like something I've never seen. Living in these brick buildings that they built themselves, that they hewn out of these, these lava quarries. And they brought me to the quarry where they, they personally go in there and they, they carve out these incredible bricks, carry them back to their lot, and they build a house on the lot out of these bricks, and they put some makeshift lift roof on their houses with a dirt floor and no glass windows and no door, just a curtain. And we went one time, and we would always go way out in the boonies to find these poor people. And I was in this home, and I was sitting with a, a, a man and his wife and a kid. And they had, a, I think they had maybe two plastic chairs, a homemade table, and a fire pit. And I had an interpreter. And I shouldn't have asked this, but I asked this. I said to the man, I said, how do you make it? How do you, how do you get by? How do you survive? Because to me, I didn't know how they made it. And his response to me immediately was, we trust in God. That was his response. We trust in God. Utter dependency on God. It was their faith, rich in faith. And they had less than I could have ever imagined a person having. And it was a big eye-opener for me, what poverty really is. Poor is when your circumstances make you incapable of being anything less than poor, anything more than poor. You're stuck. You're stuck. And they were stuck. We did eight, was it eight or nine days we did up in the mountains on horseback with a, a horseback team going to communities you can't get to by cars. And we went into the boonies, the boonies, the boonies. And it was like, wow, okay. There's a lot of pe poor people in the world. And we're living in Cocoa Beach. We live in Cocoa Beach. But like the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit. In our community, we have people in spiritual poverty. We have people in our community by the thousands and thousands of our community that are poor in spirit. They are destitute. They're spiritual beggars, if you would. And we have the spiritual food. We come here every Sunday and we get filled up and fed. And do we have a food bank, a spiritual food bank that we operate into our community? Maybe not. So shouldn't we have a heart for the poor in spirit? Sure we should. Just because someone's rich doesn't mean that they're rich in spirit. The Bible's pretty clear that it's difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because his trust and his rich, his trust and his security is in his riches. And that's who he yields to. That's who he, he worships. They're poor in spirit, and we have all the riches of the glory of God that we possess. And when we walk out that door, are we providing a spiritual food bank for our community? We should think about that. Listen to me, by my beloved brethren. Has God not chosen the poor of this world to, to be rich in, in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into courts? Do they not blaspheme the noble name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scriptures, 
You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you do that, you do well. The royal law. The royal law. What is the royal law? Who is, who is the king of glory? Jesus Christ. That's royalty, right? Jesus is the king of glory. And James is sharing with us Jesus, the king of glory's law. The God's law. The law of Jesus is to love your brother, love your neighbor, love others as you love yourself. That's the royal law. But if you show partiality, you commit sin. And not convicted by the law as a transgressor. The royal law, love your neighbor as yourself. And if you show partiality, you've committed sin, and your conscience doesn't even bear witness to the royal law to love your neighbor as yourself. And we know that the teaching, uh, as they're on their way to Jericho, that um, the Samaritan took care of the man that was laying in a ditch, naked and beaten almost to death, and he pulled him out of the ditch and cared for him. And Jesus asked the, the, the Jewish leaders, which, which one of these was neighbor to this man in the ditch? And the first two guys, one was a priest and one was a, Re, uh, a Levi. And they ignored the man in the ditch. But the, the, the Samaritan, who typically doesn't get along with Jews at all, helped the man. And Jesus said, which one was neighbor to this man in the ditch? And they said, the one who helped him. They couldn't even say the Samaritan because they hated Samaritans so much. They had to say the man to Jesus. No, it wasn't the man. It was a Samaritan who helped a Jew. Why? Because he was following the royal law. Verse 10 says, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he is guilty of all. Well, I help my friends, and whenever my friends are sick, I, I bring them soup, and, and uh, I, I help my kids when they're having a hard time. I, I, I help pay their bills, and, you know, I'm a very generous person. Yeah. Sure. Generous to a point. Oh, baby. Hallelujah. I'm not going to finish today. We'll have to pick it up next week. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord God, for how beautiful you lay it out. And it's undeniable what you expect from us and what you want from us, Lord. So, Lord, help us. Tenderize our hearts. Make our hearts soft. And help us, Lord God, to really fulfill the royal law by loving others as we love ourselves. And maybe, Lord, if we were able to love more, we could accomplish more for the kingdom. So help us today. Lord, let us just not show partiality to anyone, but to love you and love others as of ourselves. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.